Uh, good afternoon. Um, um, first of all, I'm very uh, grateful to have been invited here and especially to uh, share a panel with uh, uh, Michael. I've known him by reputation for many, many years and uh, it's the first chance I've had actually to meet him. Um, and I've been a great admirer of uh, much of his work and so it gives me a, a great deal of pleasure to be able to comment on, on some of the points that he's made. Um, um, and it's good to see some friends in the room. Um, so uh, I, and, uh, I want to start off by saying that this is an impressive, I read a draft of uh, Michael's paper and uh, having listened to this, uh, presentation. Um, I want to start off by saying that it's very, it's very impressive to analyze uh, contributions from this vantage point, uh, from the vantage point of bringing people into the system. Um, and this, what we call small donor democracy, is a, an issue that has been gaining some currency uh, in various states because it's seen, it's seen normatively as um, uh, something we want to encourage. Um, but I have to say that I'm not certain that it really changes the picture. Um, there have been in New York City um, elections since 1989 with the campaign matching, the, uh, the campaign fund um, matching program in slightly different versions as it's progressed. But in that period of time, we've seen any number of examples where candidates who have brought in the most donors, the, most, the greatest number of small donors, they've still lost. So I'm not certain that engaging small donors makes a difference in winning elections. That's important for candidates. Secondly, not just important for candidates, but important, important <coughs> to voters and those of us who observe uh, the system and participate in, participate in it in different ways, when one brings in a great many more uh, small donors, the question we have to ask is, what difference does it make? Barack Obama is a great example. And even though his number of, his percentage of small donors is not uh, that different of a range uh, than other presidential candidates, <coughs> let's accept for the moment that it was different it felt different. It seemed like small donors were more involved. His policy seemed not to have reflected that fact. The, the, the small donors who invested in and became invested into the campaign, using the word in, in, in manifold ways, their interests, their perceived self-interests, were not necessarily responded to when Barack, o Barack Obama put together his economic team and when Barack Obama, when President Obama made decisions about uh, his economic policy. We know that from the last two years that some of the people who were most involved as small donors in his campaign are most disaffected by his uh, policy choices regarding the economic recovery. And that's just an example. If Governor-elect Cuomo were elected with this hypothetical chart as reflective of a broader donor base than the way he was elected, would he attempt to implement different policies? Well, let's just look at let's just visualize in our mind what that chart looks like. There are a lot are a lot more small donors. There are fewer percentage-wise. There are fewer bigger donors. But since there are so many more smaller donors, 
how can he be responsive to those individual interests with more efficacy than he can with the smaller number of bigger donors? Actually, the reverse might happen, since they comprise, uh, they would comprise uh, a, a, a smaller piece of the pie. In a way, it's easier for him to be responsive. I, I think the whole issue of small donor democracy, while it feels like it's a good thing to have more people involved, I think it's focused in the wrong way. What we want to do is involve more people into the political system. There's no question about it. I think uh, everybody in this room would agree with that. But we can't, we can't foist upon that, uh, that normative good a campaign finance construct that attempts to accomplish bringing people into the system by rearranging the campaign finance regulatory system and think that because they uh, um, because we've lowered the contribution uh, rates that that is what brings people into the system that's not what brings people into the system what brings people into the system not is not that their hundred seventy five dollars is matched six to one what brings people into the living room into the union hall into any venue is the candidate and the issues that are being raised. Sure, it's easier to contribute, but I'm not going to contribute either a thousand or a hundred and seventy-five dollars unless I have some feeling about that candidate and some feeling about those issues. And sure, I'll be more encouraged to give that hundred and seventy-five dollars because I know it's going to be matched and it's worth a lot more. But I have to want to give to that candidate because of the issues that he or she is raising. So while I think it's all well and good to have a greater pool of people involved in contributing, I'm not sure that there uh, makes a difference in terms of the end result. And to his credit, uh, Michael suggested that, the, the, that uh, whether or not there's a different mix of people involved is an ongoing uh, issue that's, that they're still analyzing. But even if there is a different mix of people, does it have any different policy implications? In New York City, there are far more uh, candidates who are people of color running for office and contributing than there were before. Is that because of the matching uh, program? Or is that be because of the demographics of the city? And even if it's because in part of the program, is the current city council that's more reflective of a more diverse population? Do they make decisions in a way that's substantively different than before, than 20 years ago? So I'm not really sure that focusing on this, what Michael calls a new paradigm, rather than focusing in on uh, lowering contribution limits, focusing, focusing rather on bringing in smaller donors, I'm not so sure that's really where we ought to be focused in any event. What, what I think is that um, to identify, uh, th that the first step is to identify the issue that brings us here and brings us to uh, analyze money and politics, which is to say we want to try to, if not eliminate the role of money in political decisions, at least mitigate it. Uh, a matching program, I'm not so sure that a matching program mitigates the role of, of money in politics. I think a better idea is a, is a grant program, such as we have on the presidential level, on the presidential level. 
where a presidential candidate gets a lump sum, $75 million, here's $75 million, go and campaign, go speak to voters, raise the issues, develop white papers. You don't have to stay on the phone. You don't have to go to big fundraisers. Here's your $75 million in the general election. Go campaign for this period of time. So can we, can we do something like that in New York? Well, like the presidential system, we're not going to just have a lump sum for any candidate. So we would need to design and we would need to design a system where someone qualifies, where a candidate qualifies. So let's look at New York State. So we have people running for governor, uh, attorney general, uh, and control. Lieutenant governor and general run, run together. Um, in order to qualify for assuming we can fund a grant system where each of the candidates running uh, can, can get the money, how would they qualify? Well, and some states and municipalities have variations of this. Uh, let the candidates raise some money, and I'll, I'll, I'll give it a hypothetical uh, to whet your appetite, to, pro to provoke our thinking on this. Running for governor, raise from 5,000 people, $500. 5,000 people who are residents of the state, $500 each. It's not as low as 175, but it's still a low amount when you consider that a person can give $59,500 this year to somebody running state fund. So raise from 5,000 people, $500. And once you've done that, you've qualified for a grant from the state. In addition, once you've done that, you have to give that money over to what we'll call a, uh, a, a campaign fund, a public campaign finance fund. You have to raise it, you qualify, you give it over to the state. Additionally, the state can raise, because that wouldn't be enough, to fund statewide candidates, you have people contributing to the fund and get a tax credit. So you have the candidates raising money in order to qualify, you have people contributing to the fund and getting a tax uh, credit, and you have a fund. The, the fund administered by a new New York State Campaign Finance Board that will give each of the candidates <coughs> who have qualified, again, a hypothetical, $5 million to run their campaign in a general election in the state of New York. But wait a minute, I'm not going to just give you $5 million just to run. How much of that $5 million do you want me, candidate X, do you want me to put into the TV commercial, radio commercial, set aside? Let me back up. What's the most important reason, the most the salient reason for uh, the high cost of campaigns? <coughs> it's uh, advertising, TV commercials mainly, radio also, but mainly TV. And why is it so expensive? Well, in part because the New York City media market is so expensive, but in all the media markets, they charge candidates much more than they would other uh, advertisers, because they can do it, they can get away with it. And because of the timing of the various commercials. If the New York State Campaign Finance Board bought the time for the various candidates and withheld from its grant a million bucks for Blair Horner who's running for governor, we should all be so lucky. And then the government buys at its rates so that the candidate can um, advertise on TV. It's, it's um, in a way, it's, uh, it's a paradigm that people generally don't think about because it seems to be uh, inconsistent with what we already have. 
But what we're talking about here is not just uh, expanding the pool of people who are giving money. We're talking about trying to allow candidates to spend their time campaigning, dealing with issues, rather than raising money, being on the phone day after day, going to fundraisers, and so on. And this idea, it may sound a little uh, um, um, uh, unconventional, it's the kind of program that's actually been uh, recommended by the Association of Bar of the City of New York um, Election Law Committee, similar to what I'm suggesting here. And it's a way of trying to reduce the impact of money. It's a way of trying to bring down the most important cost uh, to campaigns. And it's a way of trying to involve people in a campaign that's about issues. I'll say one last thing, which is um, we still have two problems. We still have the Michael Bloomberg problem, which is anybody can self-finance, which is also similar to the Barack Obama problem, which is, well, I can raise so much money, why should I take that lump sum? They're not exactly the same, because Barack Obama obviously didn't self-finance, but they're similar in the sense that they opted out, and they had the constitutional right to be able to opt out of this program that was constructed to mitigate, if not eliminate, the role of money in a general election for President of the United States. So, the other unconventional uh, response to that, because we can't do away with that problem, would be to approach the leaders of the important uh, endorsing groups in the state of New York, the leaders of unions, the leaders of business councils, the editorial boards, and say very clearly, you have editorialized, you have uh, made a determination that you are for public campaign finance reform. If that's the case, I want you to sign a code of conduct. This is a phrase that I learned while working for the Attorney General. The Attorney General would always uh, threaten to sue, not always, many times threaten to sue the health industry, the insurance industry, and so on, and use as a tool, use that threat, if you will, promise of suing, if you will, use that as a tool in order to get them to change their conduct and have them enter into a code of conduct whereby they're changing their practices, which could have been accomplished through a lawsuit, but it's much more efficacious to do it without a lawsuit. And after all, the goal is not to penalize, the goal is to change uh, behavior. Similarly, have them take a pledge which is obviously non-binding, it's not contractual, but it's a pledge to only endorse candidates, I see I'm about to get the hook, <laughs> only endorse candidates who participate in the campaign finance program that they've endorsed, that they have supported, reducing the incentive, in a way disincentivizing a Michael Bloomberg or a Barack Obama from not participating in a public finance program. It's obviously not ironclad, but it's a way of trying to craft together a system that reduces the role of money, that gives candidates who can demonstrate their viability enough money to run a race, and to reduce the opportunity or to increase the opportunity costs of those who want to self-finance or opt out of the system. The last point I want to make has to do with the independent expenditures and Citizens uh, United, um, but I, I, I have run out of time, so the only thing I'll say is we can talk about this more during questioning, uh, during the question and answer period, but the, Michael's right, the decision of the Supreme Court didn't really change the behavior of those who wanted to pour independent expenditures into the system. They want to do that because they want to win elections. 
And given our constitutional framework, um, I'm not sure that much can be done about that except encourage people to who can want to spend money on an independent basis on uh, uh, in a partisan way to make sure make sure that your side is raising enough money in an independent way and spending enough money in an independent way to counter that. Now that's not exactly good government, but that's a uh, a problem that can't be addressed by legislation, given where we are with the Supreme Court. So I I, I welcome your comments. We've we've had very different approaches to this, and. Um, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much.